Today is finally upon us. I'm foaming at the mouth. I am so excited. <laughs> when you love trash, this is like a holiday. Hi. Hello, it's Kendall here. If you're new around here, welcome. If you're not new around here, what is up? Home skillet, biscuit, and happy Saturday. If you don't know what Saturdays are, Saturdays are when I do a little something on my channel called Bad Movies in a Beat, the series on my channel where I talk about bad movies while putting my makeup on. I've been waiting patiently for the last year and a half to touch on this gem. I am so excited because it's worse than I ever could have imagined and I'm so happy. <laughs> you, see that? you see that I'm shaking? Could also be because I drink way too much coffee. I'm also very ashy again. But when you love trash like me, there are certain series that you kind of wait for. And it feels like all the stars have to be aligned to have some foolishness like this come out. And so today we are looking at the long awaited sequel to 365 days. But before we tap into that, I think we're sponsored. There were some scheduling issues. If we are sponsored, I will send it away to Admiral Kenny Wright no. Hello. It's Admiral Kenny to let you know that today's video is sponsored by Likewise TV. We feature Likewise on the channel here before. Basically, they are an app that allows you to find personalized recommendations for any form of media, whether it be TV, movies, books, podcasts, and I've always found some of my favorites off of that app. But now Likewise is launching something new, and that is Likewise TV, which is basically a hub where you can combine all of your streaming services and put them onto one place so that you know where to watch things, what's new, what's leaving your streaming sites, but you don't have to visit each place <laughs> to figure that out. It's all in one place. All you have to do is create an account on likewisetv.com and now you don't have to spend your precious finite time searching each individual streaming site to figure out what they have only to find that you don't like anything on there. Everything is all together, clearly labeled, but because it's also likewise, feel free to rate anything that you see from any streaming site and it'll also curate new shows that you can watch all over on different streaming sites as well. So it's a great place to keep organized and not feel overwhelmed when you're looking for something to watch. Feel free to make watch lists, check out community comments on shows that you may be interested in, and also have a uniform spotlight for all things that are coming in and leaving out of all of your favorite streaming sites. And of course, getting all those personalized recommendations that you get from Likewise anyway. So if you would like to check out Likewise TV, that'll be linked down below. Feel free to follow me there. I am called Kenny JD on that as I am most places. If I'm not mistaken, my watch list is public. So if you wanna see the things that I'm interested in watching at some point, you can check that out as well. Maybe find something you'd be interested in. Yeah, big thanks to Likewise TV for sponsoring today's video. Now let's get on to the debauchery. So last week, um, Oh, last week I didn't talk about a bad movie. I talked about The Ultimatum, which a lot of you guys appreciate it because you didn't feel like watching the show. <laughs> For that, we were talking about, we watched Obsessed with Beyonce and Idris Elba, Shaven. Look like a mole rat. Uh, it was amazing. I think it was our 100th episode and I didn't know that I would have said something about it. I feel bad about that. But anyway, if you want to check that out, that'll be linked up above or in the Bad Movies in a Beat playlist. Feel free to go wild, go nuts, go crazy, go loco. Okay. Okay. I'm so excited because again, as a lover, a connoisseur of garbage, we are finally returning to 365 days because Netflix just released the sequel to the original 365 days called 365 days this day. I have never said day so often in one sentence. If you don't recall, somewhere in the summer of 2020, the original movie went quite viral. I made a video on it. Do you wanna see my video? That'll also be linked somewhere, probably down in the description box as well. 365 Days is an erotic drama. And if you're not uh, familiar with me, hi, again, I love trash. And one of the best places to have trash is within the erotic romance genre. I don't know what it is about the genre that tells people we don't have to make a good movie. <laughs> they understand that their viewership is very much so women who want to watch porn, but don't want to call it porn because it makes them feel bad. Interesting with 365 Days because there is literally nothing different between this movie and something you would have seen circa 2002 on Skinamax. <laughs> but yeah, we love erotic drama romance on this channel because 
it's ripe for comedy and I guess a way for me to live vicariously because I know nothing of sex because the only bruises on my knees are from hours of prayer and devotion to Christ. <laughs> but yeah, there's just something about them that are so fun and ripe with comedy. I've talked about many of uh, Fifty Shades of Grey and Fifty Shades of Grey knockoff or adjacent. And this of course exists in the same milieu as anything else that has come off of accidentally from Twilight. Shout outs to Miss Myers. Bitch. Now, all jokes aside, I um, am still very upset with Stephanie Meyer because we will never be free of anything in relation to Twilight because Twilight got Fifty Shades, Fifty Shades begot a bunch of other shit. And one of the things that Fifty Shades of Grey inspired was a Polish woman who thought it could go further. Hence, that's how we got the first 365 days. If you don't remember what the movie itself is about, it's about a woman who is Polish. Her name is Laura and she ends up in a twisted love affair with an Italian mob boss named Massimo. Massimo is obsessed with Laura because she resembles the hallucination of a woman he saw while he was dying from a gunshot wound. And then when he sees Laura in real life, decides to kidnap her and give her 365 days to fall in love with him. Otherwise she will be let go and return back to her life to Poland. Now, of course, being that this is a romance somehow, Laura falls in love with him, even though he's been awful the entire time and he's also her kidnapper and they decide to get engaged. And at the end of the first movie, she is pregnant. If you have not seen the first movie, I highly recommend my video. Like the movie, you could watch the movie, but like my video is hilarious. But for the most part, it's just two people boinking each other for two hours while loud, contextually dissonant pop music plays in the background. And of course her sexual attraction to this man takes precedence over the fact that she was kidnapped by a complete stranger who has overly familiar pet names. Are you lost baby girl? That make my personal pussy wanna climb up my body to shield my eyes. Now these are based off of books. No, I have not read them. No, I don't plan to. I'll send it over to uh, my friend Amanda the Jedi who definitely talked about both books and may possibly talk about the movie if she hasn't done it yet, she probably will soon. So send that over to her. I don't want it. I'm not reading it. Y'all not getting me to sit there and read them damn books. Absolutely not. I read Omegaverse and I'm never going back to this foolishness again. But this movie takes off where the last movie ended, obviously. Um, and somehow they did something that's oddly impressive in that they made a movie even less of a movie. <laughs> like, which is again, kind of impressive. I think this movie just really leaned into the fact that it is a thinly veiled softcore porno. Honestly, it just feels like what I would imagine a vlog on OnlyFans would be like, which if no one does that, y'all should do that. Right? The only thing stopping me from making OnlyFans is, is knowing that someone I know may find it. And I don't know why that's more concerning to me than like strangers, but like someone I went to like high school with, hey, I subscribe to your OnlyFans. Don't, like what the fuck? This movie somehow in a way that's semi-miraculous is actually less of a plot than the first movie, which is impressive. Cause the first movie was just her getting kidnapped, them going shopping and f This movie, uh, she's already there. So she's not getting kidnapped. They don't do as many shopping montages because I guess she has everything now. And then f***ing. I guess what they did instead is add in incredibly loud and distracting music to just spice it up a little bit. But that's the movie. But yeah, if you were expecting to see something beyond just like hot European men and the bumping of genitals, um, I'm sorry, I feel like you were under the impression that you were seeing a real movie. And I don't know whose fault that was, yours or Netflix's, honestly. Now, being that this is a sequel, it does contain all of the required accoutrement. We have a love rival, we have a misunderstanding, we have a temporary breakup. Even what little surprises it could give me along the way, we already have half of it. Honestly, the most shocking part of this movie is that it is considered a movie for some reason and that the entire movie just feels like a two hour long sexually explicit cologne commercial. But anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. Obviously I've done most of my makeup. <laughs> this is 365 days this day. That's also a terrible title as well. If you recall, the last movie ended in a cliffhanger. Laura was in the car with uh, Massimo's driver, if I'm not mistaken, and she ends up having an accident of some sort 
in a tunnel. There's nothing explained about what happened. They don't show the accident. So we're just kind of supposed to think, is she alive? Is she dead? At least at the end of the last movie. This movie, she just isn't dead. <laughs> they don't explain how she didn't die. They don't explain if it was a car crash or if someone tried to assassinate her with a weapon. They don't say nothing. They just go straight into, she's still alive. Which we knew, cause, they're, cause it's a sequel, but Damn, no explanation, cause we don't have time for that cause that's too much of a plot. We don't need that. Let's get straight into their wedding day before their wedding day and get to them immediately within the first two minutes. <laughs> but no, seriously, they get to in record time. I think it's the second sentence she says is I don't have any panties on. I mean, in fairness, 80% of this movie is them having sex and or them plugging um, toys of the 18 plus nature, if you feel me, and they're really pretty. I know that's why you're showing them. And I know you think you can sell me pretty dildos on the web. I see you. And you are correct. You used to get <laughs> so when you start off the movie, she still has that horrible blonde wig on. Not all of us are um, natural blondes. I do think they switched the wig out, something a little less Lego adjacent, but you know, Maybe not everyone should be a blonde. Not me messing up my base after making jokes. That's what I get. <laughs> That's what I get for being so hateful. Um, Laura still has her annoying friend, Olga, and they kind of speak over whether or not uh, Laura is gonna tell Massimo about the pregnancy that apparently she lost in that car crash that they didn't explain or the accident that they didn't explain at all. And she's like, no. Cause if I tell him all war will break out um, with like, I guess, rival mob people. If he already suspects that they are the reason you got in a car crash or whatever, I'm sure he's already a bit upset about it anyway. Um, I don't know why adding on top of that, the loss of a child uh, would make it even more so, but he seems pretty calm about that for some reason, <laughs> that she almost got killed. Like they don't really mention the accident at all throughout the rest of the movie. It doesn't like make him move any quicker to finding out who did it. There's no search for who did it. It's just, they get married and start <laughs> Like when I said there's no plot, not even just because there isn't anything to work with, like there's, things that we could look for who attacked Lauda. We could unpack anything, but nope. Anyway, they get married. He's still fine. Uh, very hot, very Italian. Can't act worth shit though. And I don't know if I ever noticed that in the first movie, like how bad of an actor he is. The last movie just was so ludicrous in substance in and of itself that if someone was a bad actor, it was just within an already terrible plot and script and stuff like that, she so wouldn't notice. But somehow, because there's no plot, not even a bad one, just no plot. His acting actually uh, shines through more, uh, <laughs> like a golden turd. This will come up more later in the movie because there are times at which we expect him to emote. But if he has to do any emotion other than just like staring and squinting at the camera, he's fucked, honestly. And soon into the movie, we start to notice the pattern of loud, wordy, music. Now, some songs are fine if they weren't in this movie. I think a few of them are like decent enough pop songs. Most of them aren't. But more than that, they function terribly in the film. It's just lyrically packed, jarring vlog music. For most of the movie, it was super off-putting because I couldn't tell what was it about the music that was so jarring. And I think it's two things. One, there's so much of it. I counted 25 songs, 25 pop songs in a two hour movie. That's like one every four minutes. And that's not including the fact that sometimes they cluster them together. So you wish there were four minutes between songs, but it's like a minute and a half at certain times. And then at longer times, it's just these long bouts of silence. Because the other thing that makes it so jarring is that there's no like, filler music, the mood music in the background, instrumentals to kind of tell us where the emotions are going. There's none of that. It's just pop music. And that's what makes this movie feel like a porn compilation set to music. Just people 
fucking and frolicking to 120 BPMs. Not to mention, one of the things that made it even more so insufferable is that each song sounds like almost someone else, if you get my drift. Not quite Ariana Grande. Almost Ed Sheeran. Could have been Calvin Harris. It's so distracting and it's so awful. Anyway, they marry, they have wedding sex. Can't show any of that, obviously. Which is the first of the many product placement for the black and gold dilled Roonies. The only thing to take away from this sex scene is that they put, I almost turned the movie off, a lion's roar. I almost turned it off right there. Anyway, in this movie, her friend Olga falls in love with Massimo's right-hand man. I don't know what his name is, I forget, but think of it as like a B plot that doesn't really matter because the original plot doesn't matter either. But in case it comes up maybe in subsequent movies, because I'm unfortunately I'm sure there's gonna be another one. I'm just saying that for the record. Uh, but the next few scenes, actually, who am I kidding? The next hour of the movie is literally just them having sex in random places. At some point, Lara's hair goes back to dark, thank God, hun. Again, not all of us. <laughs> at one point he put putts into a pussy. Uh, that is not a euphemism. You know, at some point we just run out of things to do. I don't know. It just seems really early into your relationship to go straight into like mini golf. At some point though, he arranges a trip for Lara and Olga to go somewhere. It's without her permission and she's not a fan of it. I will say in this movie, she complains about stuff and I'm sitting here like, like in the first movie, cause she was a kidnappy, she had more to like gripe about. But at this point you've married the man. So like, why are you mad? Apparently it's because he's controlling. And again, you met via kidnapping. Might've been like a personality trait that you should have been more cognizant of, I don't know. But it's just to remind us that she is an independent, strong-willed woman who can't be held down by a man, even if that man is an Italian mob boss. Whatever helps you sleep at night, love. I feel like the sequel though was created because they didn't expect it to go anywhere and now we have to just deal with the consequences. <laughs> the sheer fact that we've handled nothing from the first movie at all, and at this point we're a good maybe 15, 20 minutes in, is hilarious. At some point, uh, the only conflict we have is that he has work and uh, she doesn't. She's like, I don't like to sit around and do nothing. I, w I was an independent, hardworking woman before I met you. I want to have challenges. I want to, you know, do something with my life or whatever. You can't control me. Like, I want to be free. I want to do things. And it seems oh so serendipitously that this is when we meet our rival. Oh so serendipitously, this is the sequel. They always bring in a rival. You know, the person that may jeopardize our main character's relationship because she realizes that he's terrible and that she could do better. Again, let's normalize picking the second guy. <laughs> anyway, in comes Massimo's new gardener, the very attractive Nacho. Apparently he's Italian, but his family has Spanish roots or something. So that's how he got the nickname Nacho. Uh, and he's very hot. He comes in with a full 2013 Tumblr edit. Never before have I seen two men that made me jealous of rotisserie chickens. <laughs> you get that when you're older. He comes in, supposedly the gardener, barely has tools, didn't see him shovel shit the whole movie, and not a single seed was planted in the ground. Elsewhere. <laughs> Maybe a little bit harder to say. And of course, as any uh, possible love affair begins, it starts with her kind of complaining of her dreary life here as a mafia boss's wife. I thought, why was that hard for me to say? But she complains about how her life is too convenient. And he flirts with her a bit, so you could tell it's gonna be some foolishness. Fast forward and it's Christmas. Um, Massimo has invited Laura's family to come in from Poland. Olga gets engaged to the guy, the right-hand man that she's known for what, like four days. For Christmas, Massimo gives her a clothing store, like a clothing company so that she can have something to do because she's complaining about how she has nothing to do, but also, you know, do something that she enjoys, which is fashion, which is news to me. Well, she did shop a lot in the first one, so I guess that's supposed to be indicative of that, I guess. And because she doesn't know what to give the quote man that has everything, she gives him coochie and butt stuff, which doesn't feel like Christmas, honestly. It just feels like a normal Saturday night. Again, we see the allotment of uh, modulating devices. Again, if you're sending out PR, I got people like, <laughs> I should really just take the Adam and Eve sponsorship. <laughs> Adam and Eve, I've been telling you no for years. Send me the link. <laughs> 
send, send it over. I'll send it to my people. We'll get it started. At some point, this is like a half an hour, maybe even 40 minutes into the movie. They finally discuss something. Something that alludes to a plot, which is that he has a brother of which she has not been made aware the entire time, the entire like three months they've known each other. But for some reason, him withholding this information pisses her off enough that it also kind of bleeds into this random fancy dinner they end up going to. Um, she's like, you just withhold things from me. And it's just like, I've never seen a movie try so hard to build a conflict that isn't there. Cause again, we need a conflict to turn this into something other than just pornography. But it's like, you might as well just do just pretty, honestly, not that I know. There, I, I'm sure that there's a uh, pornography with like storylines that are better than this. Go look for those. Not that I know. And if I did know, it was simply research to tell you guys what heathens are doing out there. <laughs> but this, for some reason, pisses her off enough to like kind of question the honesty and the trust in their relationship. So while at this dinner, when he goes off with another woman, um, she is quick to go and try to find them. And when she opens the door, she sees Massimo giving back shots to some random woman. Now at first, um, I was like, okay, that's new. That'd be kind of cool though. Um, I know it wouldn't be satisfying to audiences, but more movies where the main guy that she like gave everything up for, who's toxic and abusive and awful, ends up cheating on her. And then she leaves him and goes with the second guy. Let's do more stories like that. Like let's watch her fall in love with this shit guy and then find someone else better. But with that said, this is supposed to be some terrible event, even though we can already see what the plot twist is. But of course she believes this is Massimo uh, having sex with another woman cheating on her. So she leaves out, no so conveniently, here come Nacho. He's like, do you wanna escape? I'll take you somewhere. So she leaves a message to her mother saying that she's leaving Massimo. She then throws her phone into, off a cliff for some reason. Girl, why? Just take the SIM card out. And then drives off to an unknown island somewhere where she can be away and, and regenerate and be at peace. Now, this ends up being where Nacho stays with his sister who is pregnant. They live very well off for him being a gardener, but he ends up admitting that his father is a very wealthy man whom he's trying to become a bit independent of. And basically for most of the movie, it it's just them like together frolicking. He cooks her food, they get progressively more tan. Again, a vlog where people f in the first half of it. Laura's mom comes and cusses out Massimo, telling him that Laura has left him. And now he is on the hunt for Laura, trying to figure out where she went. And at the same time, Laura and Nacho are getting closer. She's getting closer with his sister. Um, him and his sister have a weirdly intimate relationship. I don't know if that's a cultural thing, but it was a little weird to me. I don't know. Maybe, again, maybe it's European. I don't know. I've only been there once, Sweden. We're about an hour into the movie and we finally meet like our opponent, our antagonist, and it's this woman. I don't know who this woman is. Not for a lack of trying. I assume that she's the ex, Massimo's ex from the first movie, Anna but they don't say her name the entire movie. In the credits, I looked up the cast, there's nothing there. They don't even put like evil woman <laughs> under her. They say nothing. So I'm like, who the f is this? And she meets up with Massimo. They seem to know each other. So that's why I assumed she was the ex. And basically he's like, now I know that Laura didn't leave on her own. I'm sure you had something to do with it. I don't know why he knows that. Because she's like, you should be with a Sicilian woman because you are Sicilian. I guess that's proof enough that she had something to do with Laura missing. I don't know. So Laura and um, old dude get closer. I start to wonder if they gonna um, bump uglies because he is very fine and she feels like she just got cheated on. So he don't give a f wash it up. Meanwhile, we find out that this woman, this evil woman is actually in cahoots with Massimo's twin, his evil twin brother. Ooh, we didn't see that coming, obviously. Like, like all the other f 
and cliches that this movie has, why stop here? You know what I mean? I don't know if it's obvious or not, but in case it wasn't, Massimo didn't cheat on her. She was having sex with the evil twin. There you go. Apparently the evil twin and I'm gonna call her Anna cause I don't know what else to call her woman are in cahoots and they were trying to kidnap Laura after the fancy dinner they were at. They bring in a guy and they are upset with him because he allowed her to go with Nacho. They get so upset that they shoot him in the face. And it was real juicy. It was like, there's not been a whole lot of explicit on-screen violence in these movies. So that was kind of like, yeah, where did that come from? And then outside of that, this actually, what little plot there is, <laughs> doesn't make sense within the plot. Stick a pin in it, we're coming back to it. There's more choice moments of people getting upset that Laura's missing, mainly Olga. I'm only bringing this up because at one point she has the choice line of, I, I can't calm down in Polish. Jesus. Laura's out having a fun time, having a beautiful bronze man cook for her. She's having wet dreams about him. I get it. But the most physical contact that they have in real life is they end up kissing in the ocean at one point, but they don't have sex as far as I'm aware. Abruptly, incredibly abruptly, someone breaks into the house um, and Nacho gets him like immediately. It's very anticlimactic. It started and it stopped. And I was like, what's happening? Apparently this is one of Massimo's men who was going to kill Nacho and bring back Laura, but Nacho ends up taking him out before he can do so. The more that the event, I don't even want to call it the plot. The more that I'm talking about the events in the movie, I'm realizing it's literally just me saying, they're getting closer, they're looking for Laura. They're also still getting closer. They're still looking for Laura. And when I say looking for Laura, it's not like an active search. It's mainly just Massimo staring pensively out into the ocean or something, holding a phone, being like, find her. <laughs> and then abruptly, maybe 20 minutes before the movie ends, here comes Nacho saying to Laura, you're gonna meet my father today and Massimo's gonna be there. She ends up asking who he really is at some point. And he says, he says his real name is Marcelo and he is the son of another mafia boss, a rival boss to Massimo. They come from rival families. Somehow the bitch ended up kidnapped again. And he was like, well, you came willfully. And she was like, what if I didn't come willfully? And he would have been like, I would have made you so kidnapping. But anyway, they put her in the car, they drive off to the meeting location of Massimo and the, and the mob daddy. It's funny because you can tell that they're trying to put a plot all into the last 20 minutes. <laughs> film and it's so hard to follow. Their families have a non-aggression pact and when they kidnapped Laura, they broke that. I guess when they took Laura to the beach, they broke that. I guess nothing is more aggressive than spaghetti for breakfast. Indigestion is a son of a bitch, I get it. They want Massimo to step down from his stuff now that his father's dead. He died in the first movie, if you recall. They want to move the pact over if Massimo's twin ends up becoming the head of their organization because quote, he's an idiot. You're wrong. If you think I'm gonna put my father's empire into the head of a dog, a traitor! Who puts my dad into the hands of a dad? At some point, Nacho hands off Lara to some men at the gate. He seems to know who they are. So these are their henchmen, presumably. Mob Daddy is like, well, we have Laura as collateral. And until we figure this out, she'll be safe with my men, the daddy's men. He names who those dudes are. And Nacho's like, who? <laughs> He's like, yeah, I handed him off to so-and-so. I didn't, uh, I handed him off to so-and-so. So he handed Laura off to the wrong guards and she is now with Anna. Let's talk, oh my God, none of this makes sense. Why do you have guards that work for you that you know will not listen to instruction and keep her safe? Let's start there. But they take her to Anna and evil Massimo. So now we have to have GQ Fall Catalog get together and just walk very modelesquely with guns to figure out where Laura is because they done lost the bitch again. <laughs> Meanwhile, Laura's in a church or something where she meets Evil Massimo and Evil Massimo makes me itch. And I'm not saying that to be dramatic and funny, like, like actually makes me itch. But basically he's Massimo just tweaking and with dry mouth. And also, the most disturbing mixture of accents. It's like Italian Joker meets Silicon Valley. It's very off-putting and I don't like it. I'm happy to spend a little time with my new sister-in-law, you know? 
and have a little chat with her. And then you combine it with this weird like tooth sucking thing that he does in the twitching. Not a fan, not into it. Don't think so, you can have it. Goodbye. But she at first thinks it's Massimo and she's like, you betrayed me. And then she sees his horrible blue contact. I <laughs> not all of us can work up. <laughs> So he has his blue contacts and she's like, oh, you're not Massimo, who are you? And that's when he gives his whole like evil twin monologue about how he was the lesser son because he was born 10 minutes late. In comes Anna and in comes the GQ fall catalog. Everyone's pointing guns at each other. At some point during the evil monologue, Anna is like, we were working with Nacho to get you here. I know we don't have a plot and I know you're probably like, Kendall, why are you doing this to a plot that already doesn't exist? But what little plot there is also has plot holes. Why would Nacho wanna work with you guys to kidnap her? He's already working with his father to kidnap her elsewhere, especially because he wants to kidnap her for collateral so that she's safe. And you mother don't seem to like her very much. Why is he pointing a gun at y'all now? If y'all were working together. Also, what about the dude they shot? Wasn't he supposed to be kidnapping her? And y'all were mad cause he didn't do it right? Also, if the plan was to get her with Nacho, why? I understand why his father wants them together because uh, he can keep her safe for collateral, I guess. But if Anna and evil Massimo and Nacho were all working together. Theoretically, they could work together to just not put her in danger. Why was Mafia Daddy like, oh no, you sent her to Anna? Wasn't that the whole plan? I hate it, I hate it. Also at one point, Mafia Daddy said that they were who put Laura in the accident from the first movie and that was supposed to be a warning to him. And then during this altercation, Evil Twin says like something in regards to her pregnancy that she lost and basically was like, I always wondered whether or not the baby would look like you, Alana. So it insinuates that they were working together at some point. I hate, I just hate, like I know this movie is just throwing anything on the screen, but it just, it's insulting. <laughs> but anyway, at the mention of her pregnancy, Laura just breaks free and runs. She doesn't make eye contact with Massimo to show him like, you know, prepare to shoot once I run. Pays herself, she doesn't mentally count one, two, three, nothing. She doesn't bob and weave. She doesn't do a little juke, 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 nothing. She runs straight and gets shot. <laughs> and I laughed, I laughed. I didn't mean to laugh, but it just, it left me weak. I think it was because Y'all made me sit through this whole movie just for her to get shot. She, we ended another movie with her dead. <laughs> I'm sorry, they said, I don't know how to end this shit. Shoot the bitch. Mind you, everyone gets shot, by the way. Mas Evil Massimo, Anna gets shot, and Laura, and she's there dying. We have the aerial death camera. That was the funniest shit. I give it two stars just for that. That's the movie, by the way. Just a waste of time, waste of resources, waste of money. I like the clothes though, beautiful gowns. Beautiful gowns, nice makeup. And I like seeing hot dudes being hot. But yeah, as a movie, it was somehow worse than I expected. And I didn't expect much. I expected terrible which again, in some ways is oddly impressive. So yeah, that's that's it. That's 365 days this day. Uh, let me know what you guys thought if you saw it yourself, cause it's terrible, isn't it? Oh, no video next week. I will be flying to Orlando to my friend's wedding and I just don't wanna put the pressure on myself to have everything fixed before I can get over there. So I hope you understand. If you do wanna see me though, I'll be on more butter. Uh, I have a podcast there called In Defense Of. So if you're missing me, we should have some things pre-recorded by then. So you can see that there. But yeah, if you like this video, feel free to like this video. Follow me on all my social media, Instagram, Twitter, both of which are KennyJD. If you have more bad movies that you think I should look at, feel free to put those down in the comments section and I will see you guys next time.